Hello, all. Welcome to Worship Online. We're so glad that you're with us this morning, and we're looking forward to worshiping Jesus with you today. Let me encourage you to check out the Connect card online. Uh, you can do that by clicking on the tab at the top of your, your screen there if you're worshiping with us today on the church online platform, or by clicking the link located in the video description if you're joining us via our YouTube channel. You can also connect with us by visiting our church website at www.cherokee.com. Let me remind you that you can also give online at the church website or through the tab or the link provided on the church online platform or the YouTube channel. And your faithful support to the work and the mission of First Church is such a blessing to us, and we thank you for it. We're also going to be giving you an opportunity during the service this morning to partake of communion. And so I hope you have some juice some bread or crackers gathered together so you'll be able to participate when we come to that special time. Today, we're kicking off a new series of messages entitled Flip the Script, where we're going to be looking at some of the lies that Satan and our culture have been perpetrating on us that tend to suck us in and trip us up. And we're going to be talking about how to flip the script and live the truth revealed to us in God's Word. It's a timely and much-needed series that I hope both challenges you and encourages you in your walk with Jesus. And if you would, why don't you take a minute to text or to call a friend right now and invite them to worship with us online as well. And when you do, share with them the web address that's there on your screen. Again, I'm glad you're here. Right now, let's worship the Lord together. We are one in the Spirit. We are one. In the Lord, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that our unity may one day be restored, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Let's all stand together. We sing this in unity. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news. God is in our land And they'll know We are Christians By our love By our love Yes, they'll know We are Christians By our I worship 
Stop work, you never stop, you never stop work. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop. We sing that over our city, over our world, over that impossible situation in front of us.
once was crowned with thorns Is crowned with glory now The Savior knelt to wash our feet Now at His feet we bow
Well, we're going to transition now into a time of communion. And I hope that you have the juice and the bread ready. But before we partake, I want to take just a moment to, to call our attention to a verse of Scripture that's found in Romans chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul writes, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's what we remember when we take communion, the death of our Savior, that His body was broken. That's what the bread represents, that the body, His body was nailed to the cross for us, for our sin, and His blood was shed. That's what the juice represents. His blood was shed to atone for our sin. And so would you take a moment this morning to ponder that, to reflect on that, and then give God praise for the sacrificial gift of His Son, Jesus. And when you've done that, go ahead and partake of the elements, knowing that we're all sharing in this meal together this morning. Would you let me pray for you? Lord, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this opportunity we have to pause in our service and to think about the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. And as we eat the bread representing his body and as we drink that cup representing his shed blood, Father, may we just give thanks to you for that great sacrifice on our behalf, even when we were still sinners. Father, unite us together, strengthen us for the week that lies ahead. We ask and we pray these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You partake. We're beginning a new series of messages this weekend where we're going to be talking about some of the lies that we have believed, and then we want to open up God's Word and see the truth from God's Word that can set us free. Because whether we know it or not, a lot of us have believed lies. Now, we don't know that they're lies. If we knew that they were lies, we wouldn't believe them. But because we've believed them, we end up living our lives by them. And here's the thing about a lie. Once you believe it to be true, it can have the same power over you as if it were true, even if it's not. And so once you believe a lie to be true, it can change the way you live. You end up living by that lie. I want to give you just a few little examples of what I'm talking about. Now, these aren't significant lies. They don't have major implications for us. But just a few little examples of how believing a lie can give it the power of truth in our lives. And so one example would be carrots. When you tell your kids to eat carrots and, and you make your kids eat carrots, you're, you're trying to motivate them to eat carrots, you may say something like this. 
carrots will improve your what? Carrots will improve your eyesight, right? Except that's not true. They don't. Carrots don't improve your eyesight. Now, many of us have eaten carrots and we forced our children to eat carrots because we believe that lie. We live by that lie that carrots will improve your eyesight. But I did a little research on this, and this lie actually is rooted, and I know this is going to sound made up, but it's actually rooted in World War II propaganda. That the British Army didn't want it to get out that their pilots had radar on their aircraft. But they needed some reason for the accuracy they had, and so they spread the word that their soldiers had this great vision from eating so many carrots. That's what, to say, that's what they said. And apparently one of the writers for the Bugs Bunny cartoons had heard that carrots improve your eyesight from this World War II propaganda, and he believed it to be true, and so he worked it into the cartoons. And now millions of homes are hearing from Bugs Bunny that carrots improve your eyesight. And somewhere along the line, it just became true. And so millions of children and adults eat carrots in hopes of improving their vision. But it's not true. It's not true, but because we believe it is, it has the power of truth in our lives. That's to say we live by it and we eat carrots to improve our vision. And then another example of a lie that we often live by and again, this is not real significant, not a lot of significant implications, but a lot of us were told growing up that we could not swim right after eating, that that was just not a safe thing to do. And so I remember very well, you know, getting out of the pool and going inside for a snack, and then I had to wait 30 minutes before I could go back out and start swimming again. How many of you had a rule kind of like that, or some variation of it? I would say almost everyone watching today had that rule that you couldn't swim after eating. And maybe your mom told you what my mom told me, that it wasn't safe because there was a greater risk of muscle cramps. And so you needed to rest before you go back to the swimming pool. Except you don't. It doesn't work that way. It's just not true. Swimming after eating does not increase your risk of muscle cramps. It's not dangerous. Now, some of you hear that, and, and you hear me say that it's not true, and there's still a part of you that's like, hmm, yeah, it is. Well, no, it's not. It's really not true. Like, if you haven't done the research, if you're not medically trained to answer that question, but you believe it's true, why do you believe it's true? Well, there are certain lies that are really hard for us to recognize. And when a lie is so widely accepted by so many people, as demonstrated by, you know, when everyone seems to believe it, then it's really difficult to believe something other than what everybody else believes. There's just a lot of power in that. You don't want to be the one person who says, no, no, I don't buy that and then put your kid in danger, right? You don't want to be that person. And so when everybody else seems to believe it, then it's hard to recognize it as something that just may not be true. And it's also hard to recognize something that's a lie if you've been told it for a long time. Like for many of us, we heard that one about swimming after eating when we were kids. And the longer you've believed a lie to be true, the more difficult it is for you to recognize that it isn't true, right? I mean, we just always accepted it. We've always believed it. And because we've always believed it, then, you know, it's just hard. It's, it's hard to change how we think about it. And so, you know, even after finding out that it's not true, that it's okay to, it's actually okay to swim after eating, there are still going to be parents or grandparents maybe watching or listening today that next summer you're still going to do this to your kids. Your kids are going to come in from swimming and, and they're going to eat and you're still going to say, well, you got to wait like 15 or 20 minutes before you go back to the pool.
You're not going to let the truth set them free because you've just believed it for such a long time that it just has to be true. And so, and so you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal when we're talking about things like carrots, uh, swimming after eating. But here's what I want you to consider this morning. Is it possible that we have believed some more significant lies that have more significant implications? Is that possible? We've just accepted that some things to be true that may not be true at all, and we've lived our lives by those lies, and it's changed the story. It's changed our story. You see, it's one thing to kind of buy into the lie that it's not safe to swim after eating, but what if you buy into the lie that you'll never be good enough, that you've made too many mistakes, that things will never change, that God doesn't really care about you? What if you buy into the lie that no one really cares about you, that you might as well just give up, that you'll never be able to stop, or, or that you can stop anytime you want? Nobody will ever find out. You see, if you believe those lies, suddenly you're giving them tremendous power in your life. Because when you believe a lie to be true, you give it the same power as if it were true. And so the, the Bible tells us that we have an enemy. And the Bible says that the enemy has come to kill and to steal and to destroy. And one of his primary weapons, one of his primary strategies is to get you to get me to live by a lie. Because he knows if we can live by a lie, if we'll buy into a lie, then he has us. And so Jesus describes the enemy this way in John chapter 8. Verse 44, Jesus says, There is no truth in him, for when he lies, he speaks. It says he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so whenever he opens his mouth, the language that he speaks is lying. Everything he says is a lie. He twists the truth. He is a master manipulator. And so in this series, what we want to do is just spend some time uncovering some of his favorite lies. Lies that he has repeated to you again and again and again. Lies that you know he's gotten so many people to buy into and they're just hard to recognize. In fact, one of the things that I want to ask you to do in this series of messages is not just to, to tune in and to listen on the weekend, but I want you to pray through it during the week. Because the only way that we are going to recognize some of these lies that we've lived by for such a long time is if we ask God to reveal them to us, to open our eyes so that we can see it. Because we have a hard time seeing the truth when we have believed a lie for such a long time. And so Jesus identifies himself as the truth. In John chapter 8, it says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and here it is, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. And that's what we want to do over these next five weeks together. We want to recognize these lies that we've lived by. And then we want to be set free by the truth of God's Word. And we're calling this series, Flip the Script. Flip the script. That's a phrase that's sometimes used in writing or in storytelling to, to tell about the moment in a story where things go a different direction than you expected. Like the plot was predictable and then the script got flipped and things went a different direction. And so the bad guy becomes the good guy and the good guy becomes the bad guy. The victim becomes the warrior. The homely, uh, the homely help becomes the beautiful princess. And the script changes. 
flip the script. And so I've started using that phrase a little bit. And I'll use this sometimes in talking to couples who are having some struggles. And they've told themselves this same story about their spouse. They've been reading from the same script about their marriage for year after year after year. My husband, my husband will never make me happy. Or my wife is never going to satisfy me. Or I've just married the wrong person. Well, look, if you keep reading from that script, if you keep telling yourself that story, then you're giving it incredible power. By believing that it's true, you're giving it incredible power over your life. You have got to flip the script. You've got to start telling yourself a different story. And so that's what we want to do. Because for many of us, you know, we've lived by these lies that the enemy has told us. And we've been reading off the script that he has handed to us. And we want to replace the lie with the truth that will set us free. And so today, here's what I want to do. I want to address one of the enemy's favorite lies. Now, look, he whispers this to men and to women alike, okay? A lot of men will struggle with this as well. But I just have, you know, I've just noticed that it seems to be one of the favorites that he throws at women. And specifically, to throw at mothers. And here's what the lie sounds like. It goes something like this. You don't have what it takes. He just tells it to you every day. You don't have what it takes. You don't have the energy. You don't have the patience. And you don't have the self-control. You don't have the wisdom. You don't have enough time left. You just don't have what it takes. Now, it might sound different. You know, there might be a different variation of it. Uh, you don't know what you're doing. Maybe that's what he says. You don't know what you're doing. Uh, you're messing the kids up. They'd be better off without you. Uh, you've tried long enough. No one appreciates you anyhow. No matter how hard you try, it's not going to be good enough. You, you might as well give up. And so every time one of your kids makes a bad decision, that's your fault. That's your fault, you think. You scroll down Facebook or Instagram and you see the pictures of all the moms and their children and there's just this little voice that whispers to you, wow, you'll never be that creative. You'll never be that fun. Uh, you're never going to be that photogenic. You're never going to be that beautiful. You're never going to be that thoughtful. You're never certainly going to be that spiritual. And so here's what the enemy does. He hands you a script, and in the script he hands you, you are not valuable. You're not capable. You're not qualified. You're, you're not competent, and you're not appreciated. And he says, read this. Read this. Read this. And you read the script and you keep reading that script, and you give tremendous power to those lies. The very first lie that the enemy told the very first woman, Eve, played on her insecurities, that she didn't have what it took. In Genesis chapter 3, we read about this, uh, this story from Eve's life, and it says, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say? Did God really say that you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? And so here's what he does. Here's what the enemy does. He tries to get you to question what God has said. Because if he can get you to question God's word and God's will for you, God's purpose for you, then he's got space to fill that with something else. And Eve said, well, no. God didn't say we couldn't eat of any of the trees, just the one. And verse 3 says, just the one in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it, 
For if you do, you will die. And then Satan takes what God has said and he reverses it. That's what he does. He flips it. You see, God says, you'll die. And so Satan says in verse 4, Ah, you won't die. You're not going to die. And the serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And you know, there's a little truth in this. A little truth. But that's what he does. He, he sells us a lie by giving us just a little bit of truth. And so what's he do with Eve? Well, he plays on her insecurities. He says, yeah, you know, you don't really know that much right now, Eve. You're actually kind of naive. You don't know much. But if you eat this, then you'll be smart. And the enemy will do this. He will try to immobilize you by telling you lies that make you feel insecure. And so I want to give you just a few ways that I think the enemy will try to communicate this lie that you don't have what it takes to try to play on your insecurities. And one way is just through constant comparisons. We live in a culture, in a time where... You know, we just constantly, constantly compare ourselves with one another. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that we don't compare yourself with yourselves. It's not wise, the Bible says, but it's hard to avoid. We see problems with this, especially with some of the women in Scripture, where Leah compares herself to Rachel, and for a long time it's hard for her to find any joy because she's just always comparing herself to somebody who's prettier. And then we read about this with Sarah and Hagar, and Sarah ends up feeling bitter and angry. And with the rise of social media, I think it's almost impossible today to avoid the comparison trap, especially, especially for ladies. For moms, it seems to be more prevalent. Where you check on your feeds, you know, multiple times a day. And if you do that, it's almost inevitable that you're going to get caught up in comparisons. I just don't know how you keep from doing that. Now, there are great things about social media. Don't get me wrong. I'm on social media. I'm not against social media. But I just want you to understand to make sure that all of us understand what it is. It's not real, right? It's just this facade. It's just a lot of people giving the best versions of themselves. I mean, do you think it's a healthy thing to kind of give your heart to and, and your mind to and your eyes to on a daily basis, multiple times a day, just to see the best versions of everybody that you know? Do you think that's a good idea? It's like getting somebody's Christmas letter every day of the year. That's just not all that great. Like, I don't mind once a year hearing about how great your accomplishments are and how wonderful your adventures have been. I don't mind that. But I don't want to get it every day. That's not a good thing, I think, for the most part. For us to give our hearts to and our minds to, our thoughts to, of just hearing the best versions of everybody we know every day. But I get it. I mean, we will always just naturally only post what we want others to see. It would seem ridiculous to do, to do otherwise, wouldn't it? And so when you scroll down through Facebook or look on Instagram, just know that you are seeing these idealized versions of people. It's not real. It's a comparison trap. It plays on insecurities. It gives more weight when the enemy says things like, you don't have what it takes. You know, I just wish we could change the name of some of these social media sites so that at least everyone would know what it is. Like instead of Facebook, I was thinking we could call it Facade. I wish it was called Facade. Like, hey, are you on Facade? Do you have a Facade account? I think I've seen you on facade. Can we be facade friends, you know? 
I wish it was called facade. That way we would just all know. Or that Instagram would maybe be called mirage, right? I mean, this just isn't real. You know that, right? Like, I haven't posted to my, my Mirage account lately, but this picture is a great Mirage, but I'm definitely going to post this one. We would see it differently, wouldn't we? But we all, don't always recognize it as it is. There's a sense, and I don't want to overstate this, but I think there's a sense in which it can feel like a form of pornography almost, where you're sitting and staring at these airbrushed versions of other people's lives, and it just makes you feel insecure and that, more, that much more discontent. And from things that I've read and things that I've seen lately, I think it's especially true for mothers. Have you heard the term mommy wars? The term mommy wars is one that you might recognize. In 1990, Newsweek magazine coined the term to describe the, the tension uh, and, and the debate between stay-at-home moms and work outside of the home moms. It's kind of a phrase that you haven't heard much of probably in, in recent years. It's kind of died down, but this phrase is beginning to resurface, and it's kind of been repurposed to describe the passive-aggressive behaviors of moms on social media as they try to one-up each other. And then they get on one person's page, and they, you know, put a little emoji with, with these cute little hearts on somebody's picture, but behind the hearts... They're rolling their eyes up in their head. But it's this passive aggressiveness that becomes more prevalent. Now, I'm not going to say some of these things because I'm a lot smarter than that. But I can quote some women on this. And so I was reading this article by Sally Schulteis. And this is what the article said. Schulteis called it humble brag, motherhood's newest pastime. And the subtitle of the article is, It's the Boast Disguised as Modesty, and Moms Are Great at It. And in the article, she talks about how this seems to be a hobby for a lot of moms these days, where each day they want to post something on social media that will make other women in particular think that they are awesome. That, that they are awesome moms and awesome wives, but they still need to feel and come across as humble and unassuming. And so you have humble brag. Here's an example of the humble brag on social media. It goes like this. It's impossible to get Jake out of the house this morning. All he wants to do is play the piano. And so, you know, here's what you got she, she hooks you in by kind of talking about this every mom type of gripe. My son is never ready for school on time. And then she says, because he's a musical prodigy. That's what I have going on in my house. And so it's kind of this humble brag approach. And so here are a few humble brags versus reality. A humble brag. We're going too many directions, and we're taking a break from baseball season this year. Hashtag, let the kids be kids. Yeah, that's good. But the reality is, I missed baseball signups for my son, and we had a huge fight over it. Hashtag, too busy Facebooking. <laughs> right? Or here's another one. Humble brag. We're taking a stand. No more iPad for the kids for a while. Hashtag family time. The reality? My kid dropped the iPad and broke it, and I lost my temper. Hashtag I sounded demon possessed. <laughs> it's not real. There's just this facade. And I just want to make sure we recognize, you know, that, that we need to guard our hearts about some of this stuff. Now, I'm not talking about this because I want to make moms or anybody, for, for that matter, feel bad. I'm talking about this because I want moms and everyone to, to feel free from this. I don't want moms to feel the pressure of this every day, where they go to bed at night and the last thing they do is check their Instagram feed. 
And as they fall asleep at night, they think about how wonderful everybody else's life seems to be and how they're never going to quite measure up. And I'm not saying it's wrong sometimes. I'm just saying it's not healthy to give too much of our head, too much of our hearts to those kind of things. I just don't think it is. And I just want moms, women, men to be free from that stuff. I want kids. I mean, I want kids to be free from that so that every time mom or dad is taking a picture of them, it's not whether or not it's going to make the Instagram cut, you know? And so we're constantly looking at these mirages and these facades, and, and then you start to compare and feel insecure. And so what do you do? Well, you put something up from your life, and then you get on and you see the comments. What's everybody else saying about it? How many likes do you have? And so you look at the list of the likers, hoping that the mom that you don't like very well likes your post. And it's just... I mean, it's just all feeding this insecurity that so many of us struggle with every day. And so if you are feeling this way, I mean, if you are just feeling like you don't have what it takes, can I just encourage you to limit some of this in your life? To just kind of guard your heart and guard your thoughts when it comes to this stuff? Because some of you just need to flip the script. You just keep reading that same story over and over from other people's lives, and you need to start telling yourself a different story. Those pictures, you know, those posts, they're not real. They're not. They're not real. Without exception, every single person you see on social media is struggling. And it makes it really hard for us as people to be vulnerable and broken when we are just constantly surrounding ourselves with veneer versions of other people's lives. It's really hard. Do you know how I know that's true? Because it happens all the time in church. Church can be a lot like social media. Everybody comes in and they have the best versions of themselves and nobody really knows what anyone else is struggling with. But I know that everybody is broken. Everybody is struggling. And yet if you're in a culture, if you're in an atmosphere where you don't see that, it's almost impossible to find any kind of health or any kind of healing. Because if you can't be vulnerable and broken, you don't have a chance. And if you are surrounding yourself constantly with these idyllic uh, images and, and identities that, that aren't even real, you just need to know, you need to know that it's dangerous. There have been some studies done that, that talk about how, for, for example, uh, when someone is having financial struggles, they are more likely to post pictures of themselves uh, like on a shopping trip. Or if they're having marital struggles, they're more likely to do all kinds of posts, um, you know, with the romantic dates. Why? Because they don't want anybody to know. They are afraid somebody is going to see past the mask and they want to hide their insecurities. And if you're a mom, I just feel certain the enemy is trying to tell you that you're blowing it, that you're missing the mark and you don't have what it takes. And when you start to buy into that lie, you give it power as if it were true. And it leads to, you know, for a lot of moms, it leads to perfectionism because you feel like you don't have what it takes and so you want everything to be perfect but that's unattainable and so your family and your heart they begin to pay the price and then you become angry because you feel guilty that you're not perfect and you don't want to and you don't have what it takes and and it makes you feel guilty and guilt always surfaces in anger and you're angry at yourself because you don't feel like you're getting the job done, but you know who you take it out on. And then there's fatigue. Because after you're angry long enough, 
and you feel guilty long enough, you just get worn out. You just become tired and, and you're ready to quit. And oftentimes there's some form of escaping where you emotionally detach and you focus your attention on some area of your life where, where you're not going to feel that way. You're not going to feel less than. You're not going to feel like you don't have what it takes. And so, you know, it's, it's a new career. Or it's a workout obsession. Or it's a redecorating project. Or it's a new relationship. And the enemy loves it. Loves it. Because he knows, he, he knows if he can get you to live under this lie of you don't have what it takes long enough, it's just going to put an incredible amount of pressure on you and those that you love. And given enough time, if, of you believing that lie and, and giving power to that lie, that pressure is going to cause things to break and to fall apart. Now, I, I should say that most, you know, like, like most of the enemy's lies, this one has some truth to it. You see, when you read, you don't have what it takes, you know, that's true. What makes it a lie is not the whole truth. That's what makes it a lie. You see, the truth is you don't have what it takes. But the whole truth is that in Jesus, you have everything you need to live out what he has called you to do. Philippians 4.13 is a truth that sets us free. Paul says, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things through him. And so you flip the script, and the next time the enemy tries to get you to believe that you don't have what it takes, you say, yeah, you know what? Maybe that is true, but I know who does. The Amplified Version puts Philippians 4.13 this way, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. And here it is, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Claim it. I mean, you put both hands onto that verse and don't let go. And so just to be clear, you are too weak, but in Him, you are strong. And you are too inconsistent, but His grace is sufficient. And you have messed them up. You have. But His mercies are new every morning. And so you delight yourself in the Lord and you find sufficiency in Him. He knows the real you, not the airbrushed version. He knows your struggles. He knows your insecurities. And He loves you more than you could ever imagine. And His love and His grace can give you the freedom to break free from this lie that the enemy has been telling you for such a long time. You can stop comparing. You don't have to be perfect. And, and how He feels about you, I mean, how, how Jesus feels about you doesn't change if your kids misbehave in public. And he doesn't care if you go to bed with dirty dishes. He, he just doesn't. He doesn't care if you wear sweatpants and no makeup out in public. He doesn't care if your house is painted in last year's colors. He doesn't care if you, de if you, de if you decide to, to fix frozen pizza for dinner. He doesn't care about those things. And so you take a, a deep breath. The pressure is off. And start telling yourself a different story where you find your strength in Christ and you are self-sufficient in His sufficiency. And if you're feeling hopeless, He wants to help you. And if you're hurting, He wants to hold you. If you feel guilty, He wants you to experience the joy of His grace. If you're disappointed and you're disillusioned, if this hasn't, isn't how you thought things were going to be, he wants to be your delight. If you're lost and you don't know what to do, He wants to guide you. If you're confused, He wants to give you wisdom. 
if things are kind of a broken mess, he wants to, to come in and make something beautiful. If you feel overwhelmed, he wants to give you his peace. If you feel like you don't have what it takes, like you're, you're reading from a script and the script says, I don't have what it takes. He wants to give you a new script to start reading where you say, I can do all things through Jesus who gives me strength.
Christ. Oh.